But uh, State Representative is, not, is on his way. He's making multiple stops today, so uh, Soccer Village is one of his stops. And he said he'd probably be here somewhere between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this morning. This is, uh, I, this is one of the things I like to, I enjoy doing. Um, just getting out and talking to residents and kind of giving updates of what's going on. And um, this last week, we uh, honored our veterans with Veterans Day. About when I hear a veteran. So I hope you had a good day. I don't know if there's any other veterans that are here, but I hope you had a great day. Uh, I, was, I was here for the Veterans Memorial. I think Trustee uh, Tates and Trustee Burgess did a great job. It was a beautiful event. Yes, it was. And um, it's, it's always good when trustees step up and uh, do stuff like that. So I appreciate the work that they did. I appreciate the um, ceremony that they had here. And, and again, there's a lot of work getting the ROTC here. It's about work getting someone, a guest speaker uh, here. So, uh, and there's, there's a lot of veterans. And uh, you, know, you, you listen to the dates that some of these veterans served in, you know, the 1950s and the 1960s. And, um, and the, the gentleman who sat on the front row was like 1950 something. Yeah. So it was uh, unbelievable to see the vets that came out for that. So uh, hopefully all the veterans had a great day. Uh, I know that uh, my uh, wife and the Christian kids and everyone, we took my son out. So, you know, step of five, he's a Marine. So, uh, and everyone knows the day before Veterans Day was, you probably know, was uh, the Marine's birthday. So, 240 years. So, we're able to take my uh, son out for for lunch and spend some time with him. And, uh, so we had a had a good time that day. The um, see, it's last Tuesday. Presented to the board, we passed. Uh, our, I put out four proclamations uh, during the month of November. Those proclamations were one for Veterans Day, one for the school board member day, and National All Alzheimer's Disease Awareness Month. <coughs> and the Military Family Month. So uh, those are four proclamations that his mayor put out for the month of November. <coughs> uh, let's see what else we got going on here. Okay. We'll think about our representatives. Cover this here in a second. Probably should put this a little bit in order. The, uh, a couple weeks ago, there's a lot of people here probably that were at the board meeting or was a resident here from Candlelight Village, right? I don't know if you remember. And uh, she made a statement that none of the fire hydrants in, in Candlelight Village worked. Or there was, Candle, there was fire hydrants out in Candlelight Village. So I had her meet with uh, Trustee Myers after the meeting. He got her address, found out where she felt that the fire hydrants were not working at. And the very next day, I went with Trustee Myers along with the fire department personnel and we went to, to Candlelight Village and checked the fire department surrounding um, this family's house that they felt was not working and found out that they were all working order. So we took pictures of everything. If you're um, on my blog, you'll see that we, we blogged everything. So, you know, sometimes people come and they say stuff not knowing or they say something because they hear something, or they say something because someone told them something, right, without knowing. So uh, we tried going to the, the lady's house, but she was at work, so Trustee Myers was going to follow up with her uh, that evening. We got with uh, Candlelight Village. While the fire hydrants were all working, there was some what we call minor preventative maintenance things that they had not been doing. Uh, they're supposed to be greasing uh, or Trustee Myers can probably tell you more because you know the fire department. There's certain things that they're supposed to be doing to remove these. So if a fire truck pulls up, that it's a lot easier for them to remove these caps and stuff. So uh, Trustee Myers is working with Candlelight Village staff to make sure that they keep up with their preventative maintenance because Candlelight Village's fire hydrants is personal, is a private property, right? Those fire hydrants do not belong to the village of South Village. But Candlelight Village has to make sure that those aren't working order okay, in case of a fire. So. Uh, throughout, I think, last week and probably throughout this week, uh, the fire department will go through and randomly check fire hydrants over Candlelight Village to make sure things are being done and um, there's still no problems. So, you know, the good news is they're working, okay? And the sad news is that we have a resident that was just informed 
And uh, the good news is we are going to inform her with the correct information. That's what's always important, giving out the correct information. And, and, and sometimes the correct information is not always liked, right? Sometimes the correct information is bad news, where we find out that we're lacking in some areas. So it's important that communication gets out also. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to have to get the bad news, but it's really good. You feel better when you, when you have the good news, right? So just want to give you an update on the, on the fire hydrants. And, and if you're on my blog, you'll see this is kind of like the blog we put out and show us out there opening up the fire hydrants. And we took pictures of the fire, the water, I'm sorry, not the fire, the water pouring out of them. So um, again, and Trustee Myers is going to continue to work with um, uh, Candlelight Village. Uh, how about all the road work? Everyone that we always tease about Chicago Land area, we have two seasons, right? Winter and construction. All right. But you know, I, I even though it's a pain sometimes, and I'll leave early in the mornings and come back late at night. It's a pain, but I tell you what, in the end, it's going to be good for our community. Okay. Sometimes we have to put up a little bit with the for the pain to, for the uh, for the good, right? Uh, Sock Trail on 394 to double train lanes. Finally got the double train lane. I came home. Last night, the night before last, and both lanes were open. That was nice. I pulled right up there and turned, and uh, so that's really nice. I was out there. I was leaving this morning. I had to do some, some errands, and they're out there pouring the asphalt. So yeah, and the reason all night. So the, the reason they're doing that is because the asphalt plants are getting ready to close. So they have to pour as much asphalt as they can before they close, because once they close, it won't open again until next spring. So. Um, you, you know that they're really working hard in the one when they work all night but when they're working on a weekend. So you can see that all the work that they're doing. So very much appreciated. Um, then you come down here to Sock Trail and uh, Route 30, right? Uh, we've got we've got that closed up. We don't have it closed up because I'm sure I'm getting blamed for it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, a lot of work going on. If you, know, if you had time to go down Route 30, come up. If you're going through Dyer, if you're coming back from Dyer, you get to go over the great big new bridge. That's uh, very nice. Sock Trail is going to end up uh, going up to that bridge and then turning lane, turning right. If I go right, there will be no more light. It's going to be a lane of bridges. You'll be able to continue going. There'll be a light at the top, um, at the top where it's going to be second one to the top to where it merges under about 30. There'll be a light for the left-hand lane. Now, what's going to happen here, again, if you're uh, if you're on my blog, if you see stuff on my Facebook page, I have all my stuff on my blog, which I put my Facebook page. Uh, last word I have is Sock Trail will remain closed at US 30 to allow Sock Trail lanes to be connected to the existing pavement through the old uh, US 30. See, the detours are posted. This work will be completed by early December. US 30 will be open to two lanes of traffic through the winter. Sock Trail will, be, will also remain open to traffic at, at that time. So, what's going to be happening is through early December, this is going to go ahead and continue to remain closed. And then in early December, they're going to open it up for the winter months. Okay, there's still going to be construction signs and, and going down to, to narrow lanes. And then hopefully the work will continue again next spring, and uh, that work will be completed. I don't have the timeline exactly when it's going to be completed, but as we receive more information, we'll make sure that the village residents are aware of everything. Uh, let's see here. Should I go through some of the stuff before the representative gets here? I want to take some questions too before he gets here. Uh, I put out a customer safety security announcement from NICOR. Again, uh, if you're on my blog, if you're on my uh, Facebook page, uh, this is talking about personal safety and finance security are important. And it tells you about NICOR if anyone comes to your door, exactly what to expect. And they, they, do, they never ask for any personal information. Okay, you know, we live in a day and time where people are always trying to uh, steal someone's identity, right? Or trying to uh, dwell on seniors, it seems like sometimes, right? Seniors, they find where seniors are, and they come in there, and they try knocking on the door, and they try using threatening tactics to try to get money out, out of the seniors. Uh, we want to make sure it doesn't happen. Again, this is safety. This is security. And uh, if you get a chance, make sure you get this. Also, make sure it gets on the Village's Facebook page, and also make sure it gets on... Trustee Williams will get this, uh, see if we can get his next sock talk, see if we can get it on the website. Okay. Oh, there's been a lot going on this month. Let's see here. Crime free housing. I tell you, we've got a new chief in town. I always tease him. I said, I walk up to him and say, we got a new sheriff in town, man. 
I tell you what, this guy is a go-getter. You know, I, I'm so pleased with the choice that was made. I'm pleased with um, the trustees that supported this, uh, this decision. This trustee, I'm sorry, this, this uh, police chief, uh, he doesn't put up with a criminal. You know, we said two years ago when I was elected that, you know, we're going to go after the criminal. Okay, and, you know, two years into the administration, uh, we were finally going to make that decision. Uh, it was not happening under the former police chief. It wasn't happening under the former um, uh, deputy chief. So now, now it's happening. Residents are calling. He's getting information. Sometimes people think the police department maybe is not moving as fast as they should. But once he has the information, and what we had a <coughs> resident over by your house uh, within a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. So he went off and. I mean, he, he doesn't go after a person just to go after him. I mean, he, he does his research. I mean, we've got good investigators. You know, if they're drug dealers, if they're gangbangers, if they're, you know, they're they're putting havoc into our community, you know, we're not going to put up with it. And uh, I have a chief that's in there now that believes the same thing. He will do it by the law. Um, at a house, uh, you know, how many people heard about it? Over at Strasburg, there were some shootings over there. Bob, that was over at your house. Um, about a month ago, and pregnant, maybe about a month ago or so, there were some shootings. We've had problems with that house in the past. Uh, under the former police chief, uh, we tried to get the police department to do something. He came back and said he couldn't do anything. You know, so one of, you know, again, this is one of the houses that got put on the radar for the police chief. The police chief worked with South Suburban Gate Task Force. And I think it was, you guys look over there, I think it was like 4 o'clock in the morning. I heard some of the neighbors told me that they also they heard great big bangs. And South Suburban's task force went with our police department in there and raided the house. Uh, drugs, guns, uh, made multiple arrests. Okay? We're sending a message out now. Okay? That message is to the criminal element, South Village is not a place for you. We will continue to push that, that message out. <coughs> If you're a law-abiding citizen, this is the place. This is the place you want to live. We want to make our streets safe. We want to make it a place where our model here is a, is a community of pride and progress, right? So we are really uh, pushing. Um, I meet with the chief, you know, if not daily, for sure weekly. There's not, probably not a day go by that I don't talk to him on the phone. And uh, I've asked him to make sure he keeps the trustees abreast of what's going on. So he's very good at shooting out emails and making sure that they know what's going on so there can't be any complaints there. And again, a lot of times things are under investigation. We can't really talk about it. But uh, you know, he's, he's a person that follows up. If you have a problem in your area, please make sure you talk to the chief. Uh, he will do a follow-up. Again, he may not move as fast as you think he should, but you know, he will make sure that he takes all the proper steps and he'll make sure he does it by the law and make sure that he do the investigations uh, properly. Because you know, we've had some complaints that he can tell you because he's the one that's doing all the people and taking the complaints. We've had some complaints where the person didn't like their neighbor. So they called the police department on their, on their neighbor to try to do something about it. And there's really nothing they could do about it. After they do the investigation, they find out that it's, uh, it's been a, a feud between the neighbors for years. And uh, so he's very good at being able to identify is it just a feud or is it an actual criminal, criminal element? So they've been very good at doing that. Uh, we've been putting a lot of time in our investigations and our investigators. Uh, so, you know, I'm very pleased with our police chief. I am very pleased with our police officers that are out there doing their, doing their job. So, um, I know that uh, quite a few months ago, I wasn't probably the most well liked, and there's probably still some in the police department that are not happy because I did not appoint the deputy chief. Uh, chief. But the reality is, she wasn't doing the job. Okay. She was hurting our community. And by hurting our community, she was destroying our community by not doing her job. So she was not the right person. I still stick behind my statements today. And um, it's proven fact that when you bring a professional in here that knows what he's doing, what can be done, and how fast it gets done. So the um, Let's see here. So the way state representatives, um, chief of staff, come in. So one of those.
Let me open it. I'm not here yet. So let's go ahead and continue going on. Uh, let's see here. There's a, I always have a problem with this word. Long, ter long care ombudsman program. I know I'm saying the word wrong, but <laughs> there's a free enrichment seminar for seniors that's happening on November the 19th, that's next Thursday, at the Richard J. Daly uh, Daily Center. So make sure seniors, if you don't have anything. I put, whenever something comes out for the seniors, I always post it. And I thought it was funny because uh, last week, or last month, there was one for bankruptcy, and they were attacking why are we telling our seniors why they should file bankruptcy. But again, there's these seminars are putting out for seniors. So we're, we're not putting the information out there, what it is. Um, I think you have to know. Because you know, I don't know the problems you're facing. I don't know, um, and I'm looking around because I see there's probably a lot of seniors here, but I don't know what the problems that seniors are facing. And I don't know, you know where they're at financially. So if there's a seminar out there, it's free. I'm going to make sure that it's, it's sent out to the residents. All right? Uh, let's see here. Here's something I really got attacked on. I don't care because it's true, right? Uh, we put the blog out. The elephant in the room. I don't know if you all got to read this. This is about blight okay, and how it affects our community. But when, I, when I talk about this, first of all, I want to say, first of all, thank you. There's a lot of people who think for all the work that's been done already. Okay, we've been attacking this, but you know, you, you think about the beautification committee. There's a few members in here. Okay, all the work that they're going off and doing out there, cleaning up, planting flowers, trying to make our community look better. The housing authority, with going out and mowing the grass and identifying homes and working with the state. I'm sorry, with the Cook County Sheriff's Department to bring the information to the board so we could pass it so that I could put my signature on there so the Cook County Sheriff's Department could come in and start tearing down these homes that are, number one, eyesores within our community, that are areas where the criminal element want to hang out and hide and stand in front of and use their scare tactics to affect our, commu our community and our residents. Okay? Those houses are coming down now. Now, we had one house on Peterson Avenue. They set on fire three times. Now, I, I had the mayor of Crete say, you know, I sent, I sent our fire department over there all three times. What are you going to do with that property? Well, now I can send them back and say that that house is gone. They've got nothing there to set on fire now except for maybe the concrete that might still be there. Okay? So, you're going to see a lot more houses coming down. These are houses that have either been caught on fire. They're houses that are in areas where the criminal element, I keep on calling them the criminal, criminal element, I call them that. They got other names. They're thugs. You know, and I can come up with probably a lot more than the other names of these people are. They're not, they're not residents. They're, they're, they dwell in a community and go after residents and they use fear tactics. Okay? So as I said earlier, now we're going to fear them. Oh, that's important. You see problems in your neighborhood, call the police department. You see something that doesn't look right, call the police department. You see a car come on your street and you don't know who it is. There's nothing wrong with calling the police department and say, I have a suspicious vehicle sitting on my street. You see someone walking down the street knocking on doors and you don't know what they are, call the police officer. Call the police department. Because people will continue doing stuff that's illegal and criminal as long as they know they can get away with it. These guys, these guys, all guys, but these people that come in, into the communities like ours, if they realize, okay, I get down halfway down the first block and I got a police officer pulling me over, that means there's people around here watching. They're watching their neighbor's houses. They're watching what's going on on their, on their block. So we had on our block a bunch of kids walking down the street They'd stop in front of every house like they were talking while they were looking up toward the driveways. And they'd go down to the next one and look up the driveways. Police saw we got three calls. You know, neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. Police officer, these guys didn't get halfway down the street and had three squad cars on them. And it wasn't on my block, it was on the next block over, and the neighbors told me about it. Three, three squad cars on them. They're like, hey, what are you doing? You know, and of course they said, oh, we're just walking. And the police officer said, well, keep on walking. And, and by the way, there's a sidewalk. Walk on the sidewalk. So, you know, they're, they're sending messages to these guys. But we talk about the, the blog was called The Elephant in the Room. We talk about flight. 
talk about how it affects our community. Okay? You know, we're looking to try to bring more businesses to our community. We're looking to get the houses filled in our community. We're looking to bring residents back to back to Saint Doge. And uh, it's important, the work that's happening. You know, we put the first one called the elephant in the room. The second one we put out, which was, um, you know, if you want to call these a series that we're going to be putting out. The second one we put out is called Fighting Blight. That was the second blog. And then the third blog that will be coming out soon, and I even, I think I wrote the name down. Um, there's, a, there's a third one that will be coming out probably pretty soon. That's going to be talking about all the work that's being done, especially through the Housing Authority and the Cook County Sheriff's Office and our, our local police department. So um, a lot of things happening, a lot of things going on in Sog Village. And I've got this other stuff I don't want to go on. I'll tell you, I'll share with this last thing, and then I know the state representatives should be coming here um, within the next probably 10 minutes or so. But uh, this last week, sorry about that, just fell off. All right. <laughs> this last week I was down in Springfield. There is a very important bill, and our state representative that is coming today was a co-sponsor to that bill, and I thank them very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that every state representative that represents South Village voted in favor of this bill. Okay, this bill passed um, bipartisan in the House, 115 votes to one. There's only one voting against, and I think there might have been one or two that voted present. Okay. <clears throat> this bill, let me kind of give you an idea. It's called House Bill 4305. Okay? We're now trying to get this before the Senate. We've already reached out to the governor. The governor has um, stated that he was in favor of it and that he will sign it. Okay? Here's what we face currently. The Senate has already shut down for the, for the year. We are trying to get the Senate to go back into a special session just so they could pass this bill. And we're asking them to pass it with a bipartisan vote just like the House did. So what does this bill do? Now if I told you yeah, House Bill 4305, probably no one would know about it. But if I told you uh, the lottery bill or the gaming bill, a lot of people would know about it, right? Because that's all you hear about the news, the lottery. People want to get paid. If you make, if you win the lottery and you have more than six hundred dollars, you can't get your money, right? This bill is supposed to help people get their money. Well, let me tell you something about this bill. This bill is important to municipalities. Think about this. House bill restores the distribution of local government revenues. You know, right now we're not receiving our our, our revenues coming from the state. You know, Sauk Village is just like every other community, we're starting to face hard times. Because our money is sitting in Springfield. Alright? It, it includes MFT funds. Okay? MFT funds is motor fuel tax funds, right? Those are funds we use for buying our salt for the winter. Those are funds that we use for repairing our roads, our sidewalks. Those are funds that we use for our other projects. Okay? Wireless 911 fees. You pay your, your, your wireless bill every month. You see there's a fee under for 911 fees, right? That money's sitting in Springfield. They're not releasing it to the municipalities. Uh, gaming fees. Okay, we, we already talked about it. That includes your lottery and your scratch tickets. But there's also some fees that municipalities receive for the gaming machines that are sitting in bars and stuff, right? Those funds that we use also help our community. The most important thing is it restores distribution of police training funds to law enforcement training standard boards. Now, it's important that our police officers are trained, right? So, and there's some other things that's inside this bill we talk about, I'm talking about now how it affects the municipalities. Hey, Mohan, give me some, some notes. If you think about this, the uh, MFT funds, lack of funds that affect roads, local roads, upkeep maintenance, uh, repair work, snow removal, purchase of road saw. And other local improvements. When we don't have our MFT funds, our vendors are not paid. So, you know, everyone wants to talk about Springfield not paying, right? You just heard on the radio last week that one trucking firm that was working for the state no longer will, will work for them until they get paid. You know, I stopped at a, um, 
a rest stop on the way down to Springfield. I stopped in there for just a minute. And you pull it up, there's no power to the rest stop. There's no water to the rest stop. There's all these truckers coming out and they're all upset. You know, here we are in Illinois, communities, uh, Illinois is broke and can't afford to keep the lights on, can't have water. You know, the, uh, the vending machines were not working because there's no power. So um, you, you think about what MFT funds can best for, for a community, especially with us paying our vendors. 911 fees. The impact of 911 uh, wireless fees impact, again, unpaid not being able to pay our vendors, unpaid service fees, thereby lacking 911 emergency services to residents. Okay? That's why it was so important for this bill to pass. That's why it's so important for the Senate to come back and pass, pass this again with um, bipartisanship. We already talked a little bit about gaming fees. There's another thing in there called use, a use tax. Okay, these are non receipts of user tax. Uh, they also affect us because we use those for our general operations. So, you know, Springfield is spending a lot of money. You know, the governor was, I guess he thought in his, his wisdom that he was being nice. He said that he was willing to allow municipalities uh, to put a loan on these funds. And he was going to give us a low interest loan on funds that, that belong to us. Okay. For mayors and managers, um, we rejected it. Okay. Why in the world would you take a loan on your own money and have to pay the state back the interest off our own money? So it's, it's crazy. So, you know, the state right now is sitting on millions of money that they have not released, not only to municipalities, but to their vendors and, um, and, and other, other, other things. You know, you think about your nonprofit organizations, they're not releasing the funds to, they're not releasing their funds to the hospitals and schools. Um, you know, so it's, it's affecting everyone. So, you know, while I'm not in favor of what the governor's doing, I'm just, at the same time, I'm trying to be cordial and trying to make sure that uh, I don't want to offend the governor because it can be very easy to offend someone. Okay, but we're trying to send a clear message. You know, release our funds. Because I, I heard it really good the other day, and maybe State Representative uh, Algie Stone said it. You know, you think of a business, and the governor's trying to run the state like a business. You know, the business, a business is something that brings money in, right? Okay? A government is something that provides a service. We're not making money off what we're doing, right? You know, we don't charge the residents every time a police officer goes to your house. You send a police officer to your house. We're not charging you every time a fire truck pulls up with a fire out unless you don't listen to village. <laughs> we're not charging every time a fire truck comes up. We're providing a service. Now, we're providing a service by keep making sure the streets are plowed. We're providing a service to make sure they're soft. On there. We're providing a service when it comes to the water department, when it comes to having the administration here. There's services and we're not making money. You know? So while you want to run a municipality, when you want to run a government like a business, that's a good that's a good to a certain sense. Okay? I can say to a certain point, I'm sorry. Because there's things that even as government, there is things that can be can be shrunk down, right? There is areas where we can work a little bit leaner. And right now, Saw Village is working at the leanest it has ever worked. And you'll hear every department head say, I can use more people, right? So there is some times where there needs to be some leaning. But at the same time, you have to remember that as a government, we're providing a service. We're not making money, okay? So um, the governor, I, I think the government, governor is waking up a little bit. While I was down in Springfield, I heard some things that he's come back on. You know, when he first came in office, he said he was going to cut these services and he was cutting this. And he was, he was doing executive orders and stopping this. When I was down in Springfield this last week, we see where he's pulled back and started releasing some of those things and taking back some of his executive orders, okay, which is good um, for everyone. While I was down in Springfield, can I give you an idea of who I met with? Of course, uh, State Representative OG Sevens is coming in here today. I met with him, um, Marcus Evans who is our state representative, which has from Torrance Avenue, all the way to the state line. And I saw Thaddeus Jones, and met him for shortly, who is our state representative from 394, going all the way over um, past Cottage Grove. So depending on where you live, you take Sog Village and divide it in three sections. Right now you're sitting in Marcus Evans, 
um, jurisdiction, his district, right? You cross over this street right here, you're sitting in O.G. Sims district. Then you cross 394, you're sitting in Daniel Trump. So those are our three state representatives. We also have um, two senators, which I wasn't able to meet with, but we have uh, Donnie Trotter and we have Napoleon Harris. Those are our senators. Okay. I would encourage everyone. You know, sometimes our state representatives who represent us all they hear is the bad, right? Now, as an elected official, sometimes it seems like all I hear about is the bad. But sometimes there's good. Encourage your state representatives. You know, here we are in the holiday season, right? We're in the month of, of November. This is the month we say there's a lot going on, but we're getting close to the end of the month. This is a, a month to be thankful, right? We've got Thanksgiving coming up at the end of this month. You know, send a thank you card to your state representatives. I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying it'd be nice. You know, send your state representatives a Christmas card. Next month we're going into Christmas. So, you know, they need encouragement just like, you know, your trustees up here, your mayor needs encouragement. All right, so, you know, think about them. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's, it's easy to remember when things are going bad, but sometimes it's difficult to remember when, when things are going good. All right, so, um, tell you what I'm going to do. He's going to be here shortly, but... I'm going to open up the room for questions, and see what kind of questions I'm at. I've talked enough. I'll tell you, here, where's the boys at? Here, test the center on it. They're right in here. Test it, test it. Test it. Okay, you have to talk right into it. <coughs> We're talking about those houses that, uh, whatever, rated, whatever, whatever you want to call them, the, the right word. But what happens? Um, okay, the police corner, they make these arrests. Does that mean the homes are vacated? Um, or they arrest the people that are the criminals that are in the home, or are the homes empty now, or what happens with that? There's different stories for every type. Uh, some of the ones, uh, especially under the crime free housing, you know, we contact the, uh, the landlords, we contact the state, we contact the county. Uh, depending on uh, the crime, like there's um, more, I guess you call it teeth, when you start finding weapons and you start finding um, drugs. Okay, so there's a lot more things that they can do. They can go in there and, and pretty much uh, tell them they have to leave. Okay, so uh, again, that's part of you take everything, you file your charges with the state and county, you, you, um, um, you send stuff down to the county to have them removed from the house, you contact the landlords. So, um, we know we've got the, the crime free housing ordinance, which the police chief is working really, um, he's working hand in hand with the housing authority. So like when we have a house, like with the drugs and the, uh, the guns and things like that, they're using our crime free housing ordinance to go off and try to take that house. So, I'm oh, sorry. You know, everyone, I've got, I mean, do some introductions here. We've got J.W. Fairman, he's our village administrator. And then I saw in the back, we have Trustee Myers. Trustee Myers is sitting in the back. Um, so, and I know the village clerk said she had a library meeting this morning, but she's going to be coming here. Uh, this is my, my memory sometimes, so he can probably tell us a little bit more what's going on here. Yeah, Mary, you know, uh, in addition to that code enforcement and the police department put the stickers on it, this uh, house that's under, you might want to just go ahead and elaborate on that. Speaking of a sticker, all right, here's something that we started. Vacant homes, because you're going to start seeing these on houses, okay? If you see this on a house, <coughs> on a front door, and you see people inside that house, call your police department, okay? Sockville, just like a, just like a lot of other communities, has uh, started to find out we have a lot of what people would call squatters, right? People that are moving inside these houses, and we're finding a lot of these houses that when people left, they didn't turn off their electric, they didn't turn off their gas, they didn't turn off their water. So people are just going inside these homes and they're living, and they're running up the bills, and the banks cannot get up, get into them because you know the banks have a process that they have to follow, and there there is a large amount of time, and I can't I won't tell you I'm not going to pin down the amount of time, but I I've heard people say it can go for months or it can even go for years before a bank can get their hands on property. So this is one way that we can go after the squatters. This is one way we can go after people in the criminal element. This is one way we can find out, you know, it is, you, you think of everything. 
everything. Someone could be having uh, some drugs out of his home. Somebody could grab someone off the street and do some terrible acts and take them in these houses. This is what we're looking at stopping them. If you see one of these on the house and you see anyone on these properties or going into these homes, call your police department. Okay? Also, the code enforcement. You know, for those of the code enforcement is going to put a sticker on that is right so they can see it. If they find somebody, they just, they're not going to go and they're going to call the police. And then police put a sticker on it and arrest them. The particular house in my neighborhood had been a problem house for months and years. And I had complained and complained to the former police chief. And I don't know why. No idea why they couldn't do anything, but there had been police calls. At one point in time, there were seven calls about that particular house in one week. Now, when our new police chief came in, it took one call. He goes out. They find that those people are squatting in that property, and there was uh, illegal use of our water. The water had been shut off. They find a way to come back and never paid a water bill, and they're, they're still living there, 17 people probably in that house, and it took one call to our new chief, and he took care of that house. He moved them out within two days. But they're still in the neighborhood, so, you know, we have to watch that. But thank God we have a chief that's got the go get them and take care of the problem. Thank you. What we're going to do is our state representative Tell you a little bit about our state representative here. State representative LG Sims understands the value of hard work and how it come, um, how to come up with common sense solutions to real world problems. He's an attorney of a second generation small business owner. His commitment to hard work began at an early age while working in a family business, where he learned that nothing in life is given uh, but must be earned. Throughout college and during his time. Uh, working in Springfield, he often committed. He's often committed. I'm sorry, commuted to downtown. Got glare in my glasses. The downstate Illinois to help run the family business on Chicago South Side, and while putting himself through law school, state representative is committed to public service. Began at an early age, working in the youth ministries in his church. Continues to make a positive impact on every community of which he is pleased to be part of, as he was always taught, to whom much is given much is required. He remains active uh, in many civic organizations whose mission is to improve the quality of life for the communities they serve. As a community leader, he has worked and provided scholarships and books to children who need and work to make a community more safe. As budget director of the Illinois Senate, uh, Democrats, uh, LG helped to put millions of dollars into improving the quality of life in our communities by providing funds for education, capital improvements, health care incentives, and economic development activities. As our state representative, he continues to, be, uh, continues to put family and community first. During his term in the Illinois House of Representatives, he has championed leg legislation focused on improving the quality of our schools, strengthening the middle class by creating good jobs, bringing fiscal discipline to Springfield and passing common sense public safety initiatives to make our streets safer. State Representative and his wife, they have two daughters, and they live in the neighborhood of Chicago. Kind of give them a little bit of a uh, professional. He's a state representative of the 34th district, which we just talked about, between Torrance Avenue and 394, here in South Village. He is attorney, law office of LG Sons Jr., he's a former budget director, he retired uh, for retired Illinois Senate President Emo Jones Jr. Community service uh, consists of as a member and immediate past president, the board of directors of the uh, Chasen Park Homeowners Association, he's a member and director of South Central Community Services, member chair advisory council for Big Shoulders Fund, member of Chasen, Chasen Avalon Park Community uh, Com I'm sorry, Council, member of Great Chatham, the Chatham, Chatham, sorry, sorry, Chatham uh, Alliance, member of West Chesterfield Community Association. Do you have time to be home with family? Let's see, member of uh, Park Manor's neighbors, 
Community Council, member of South Holland Business Association, member of the Board of Directors of the Charles H. Wesley Foundation, member of the Board of Directors of Alpha Phi Alpha Building Foundation, member of the Illinois State University Black College Association, member of the University of Illinois Springfield Alumni Association, member of Loyola University Chicago Alumni Association. Uh, and I'm sure he can probably tell you a lot more that he's doing because I tell you, he is out there every time I turn around, he's there. You know, I, I had a great privilege the other night. <laughs> <laughs> the other night, uh, Anthony DeLuca had um, wheelchair basketball. And if you're on my Facebook, if you're on our blog, you've got to see that. I still haven't got all the pictures out, which I've got some of these pictures. It's good. I've got, <laughs> I've got some great pictures, though, of the state representative blocking. <laughs> But uh, this was a great event. Our state representatives, and, and uh, state representative Sims was one of them, went out there and, and in wheelchairs playing these young people. There was even some older people out there who have disabilities and, and are stuck in a real wheelchair the rest of their life. It was a great time to watch them out there playing basketball and having fun. And uh, again, making people aware of what we have in the South Southern, and making people aware that there are people with disabilities, there's people that are less fortunate than us, but doing it while having fun. So, um, it was great to see him out there. Uh, I'll let him tell you what the score was. <laughs> <laughs> so, but without saying anything else, I can introduce our state representative, my friend, O.G. Sims. Dirty, dirty. <laughs> uh, yeah, the score, but we, we lost. Um, I, I told one of the kids that it's starting to feel like we're the Washington Generals. You know, the team that always plays the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah. That loses every year. They put up a good fight, but they always seem to lose. Um, so, you know, it was it got so bad at one point that the score was, I, I'm going to tell you, I'll just fess up. The score was like 16 to nothing. Yeah. <laughs> 16 of them. I mean, these kids were, they were, they were wearing us out. So uh, they actually brought in, they gave us one of their players. They said, you, you guys just take her, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll be fine. So we, we played six on five <laughs> for a while because we were just getting, we were getting hammered. So, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, it, was a, it was a whole lot of fun because, but most importantly, it was, we were able to bring awareness to the special recreation Association of Special Recreation Districts. And I, as I was talking to another one of the representatives after the game, we were, we were talking about how we can bring those types of services to our portion of the South Lake. And they've got a beautiful new facility. It was over in, in New Lenox, uh, Lincoln Way Special Recreation Association, Special Recreation, Special Recreation District. Beautiful facility. And we talked about how we can bring those types of services here because we want to make sure that individuals who, 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 have, who have disabilities or who suffer from disabilities, they don't have to drive 45 minutes or an hour away from home to enjoy those types of facilities. So that's one of the things that we'll be talking, we'll be talking to our mayor about and trying to figure out how we can find those types of services. And let me pause for a moment and talk about our mayor for a little bit. He has been a, a supporter He's been a friend, not only to me, but to the residents of Salt Village. And I want to publicly thank him for the hard work that he does on behalf of the residents of Salt Village to make sure that this community never gets forgotten about in Springfield. He, is, he works tirelessly with myself, with our other state representatives, both uh, Thaddeus Jones and Marcus Evans, our state senators, Don Trotter and Napoleon Harris, to make sure that, they, that we all understand what Salt Village needs, but also what it wants. He is one of your biggest advocates, and he works tirelessly to make sure that uh, that software gets what it needs. So give, give him a round. <laughs> you know, I, the, we, were, we were kidding. Uh, the one day we were out doing the clean up Salt Village, I was joking with him that uh, you know, not, not everybody gets the chance to see this part of the job. Everybody sees they, they think that you know everything's all glamorous and you know you, people you, you get to speak and nobody sees when you're out at eight o'clock in the morning cleaning up cleaning up the trash on the side of the road nobody nobody sees that uh, but and again I want to thank thank the mayor for that um, so Mr. Mayor.
Merritt, and I talked about this before, before we had, I had gone to Springfield uh, last uh, earlier this week, and you probably heard some very interesting uh, things going on in Springfield. But before I talk about that, who's, who's seen this? Has anybody get, got one of these in the mail? You got one of these in the mail? Okay. Did you like it? <laughs> if you didn't, let's make sure we get you some copies. <laughs> So this is, this is my, my 2015 community update, just kind of outlines some of the legislation that I've been working on, um, some of the things that we're doing in Springfield, but also it must be, it's, it's my effort to keep you informed. And as I, as I always do, we talk about not only the printed copy, because the printed, the printed newsletter we only send out once a year, obviously for, for budgetary reasons, but our print, our, our electronic newsletter. So if you don't have access to my electronic newsletter, you can sign up on my website. That comes out at least once a week. Uh, it's, you can sign up at rep sims, rep, I'm sorry, R E P rep L G E L G I V sims, S I M S, the number 34.com. So rep L G sims 34.com, right side of the screen, it'll, it'll say sign up for our e newsletter. Just enter your email address. It'll ask you to confirm that you want to sign up for the email address on the next page. Once you say confirm, you'll, get, you'll be added to our e-newsletter. We send that out, again, at least once a week. We send out, earlier this week, I sent out uh, an update from what happened in Springfield. I, I sent out, I think we sent out some job announcements uh, yesterday. There, there are several, uh, several uh, forums and things like that going on around the city this weekend, around the, around the Southland this weekend, and this, uh, this next week coming up. So we sent those out uh, yesterday. So please, 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 please sign up for that because it helps us to keep you informed. Now, now let's go back to what's going on downstate. We've got some real challenges, some real challenges. Um, this, this last week, we had the opportunity to vote on two critical pieces of legislation. One would have, would have rolled back changes to our state's child care program. On July 1, the governor changed the eligibility requirements for child care funding. He reduced them from approximately, 20, approximately $2,200 a month down to $600 a month. So only individuals who made minimum wage for, for a parent with two children it only make about $600 a month to receive child care funding. We, we, we had a bill that would have taken that back up to the $2,200 level, 185% of the federal poverty line. The governor fought back. He said, you know, that we, we don't have the money. We, we can't do it. We can't do it. But right now, there are about 90,000 kids who aren't getting services, 90,000 children across the state. We said, we want to make sure. He said, well, I've agreed to increase the level back to 162% of the federal property line. Well, what's important about why he said, he said well, I've agreed to move back to 162% of the federal property line, so you don't need to pass your bill. There were many of us who were concerned because several months ago, I don't know if you remember, we had this discussion a couple months back as we fixed the fiscal year 15 budget. There was also an agreement then to fix the 2015 budget. And no sooner than we agreed to fix the budget, we did all the changes to the budget, no sooner than the, the, the agreement, he signed the agreement, he changed the agreement. No, it, 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 it was, we, we, called, we called it, it's been dubbed the Black Friday Massacre. So after we, after we made this agreement, after the agreement was signed, no sooner than he signed the agreement, he came right back and, and instituted more cuts. So folks were a little hesitant to take him at his word. So part of the problem we've got right now is it's an issue of trust. Our government is not working right now because people don't trust each other. If I can't trust your work, if I can't trust that you're going to do what you say you're going to do, it makes it very difficult to agree to do the things that we all that we all need to do for people, so that we this this bill comes up, we we need, we need to pass it to 
to institute these rules at 185%, it doesn't pass. It fails by one vote. Okay? So we had a number. We had a bill to uh, make sure that you lock in what's called the determination of need score. Determination of need score, it, it's used to determine eligibility for individuals who are seniors going into the home services program or individuals who are, who are disabled going into the Medicaid program. He wanted to raise the score so that again, you would take you would eliminate over two thirds of the people from even being able, being eligible for services. We pushed back on that and said, "Well, that's not appropriate. We want to make sure that we keep eligibility. The score would the score would allow for our Medicaid program to continue." Yeah, he fought back on that and he said, "Well, right until right up until the time we were going to act on the bill." He says, well, I'm gonna, I, I, I agree with you. Just trust me. You know, I, I, we'll, we'll fix it. We don't need to pass that bill. Okay, you've not shown me anything that I can say, I believe that uh, you've had to, you, you, you've taken these stances, and you've taken these stances before, these issues have been out here for months, and now in the 11th hour, you've seen the light? Again. Members of the General Assembly had a hard time believing that. So we pushed forward with the bills. And again, this bill it failed to pass. It is really becoming evident that in order for us to move forward, we're gonna, we're gonna have to have some really hard discussions and folks are gonna really have to start talking to each other and really have to get past what happened yesterday. But to that end, and so on, let me give you a little, little background on some things that are going on also. Uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Wednesday. So Wednesday, uh, I don't know if you may have been hearing about some of the things going on in the city of Chicago about education, things like that. So I've mentioned to you on a couple of occasions before that this uh, the governor has uh, taken this political fight to a new level. He has a pack that's got about $20 million in it that's only scheduled, it's only, it's only purpose is to attack members of the Chicago Democrat, Democratic Party. So any member who is elected from the city of Chicago in the House or the Senate, it's, it's, meant, it's meant to attack us. So we have, myself and Senator Trotter, have received four negative mail pieces since, since, early, since early August. Four. It's not even December 1 yet. Petitions aren't even done. Yet. So you can only imagine what we're going to see. If he's already got four up there, you can only imagine what's going to happen after uh, after we really start campaigning the campaign season. Well, as part of that effort, he's been trying to get schools, and parents, and children, and everything to attack elected officials. So there's been this, this concerted effort to have members have, uh, have school children and their parents come to protest us. Wednesday, on Wednesday, we had several hundred children pulled out of school, pulled these kids out of school, brought them to my office to protest budget cuts in Springfield. Budget cuts that are the result of actions taken by the Chicago Public Schools that have now tried to lay them at our feet. So there were several hundred kids at mine and Senator Crowder's office on Wednesday protesting when these kids should have been in school. I appreciated them coming because we wanted to we want to show our young people the that civic civic engagement is critically important to the vibrancy of our of our democracy. But to take these kids and use these kids as pawns was wrong. It's wrong. To say to them, well, this is their problem. If, if only you, if only they vote for issues that matter, issues that are that, that focus on my tur my turnaround agenda, we can give you the money that you need. Well, if you if you have them, if you vote for those issues, those items, it will fundamentally change the course of your life. Fundamentally. But this is this is the environment in which that which in which we're in. Right now. We are in an environment where. The truth doesn't matter. We're in an environment where we're only going to attack one another. We're not going to. We're not going to. We have 
folks who don't want to solve problems but only want to create them. And you know, I, I have said to him on a number of occasions, I don't believe that we should have Washington-style gridlock come here to Illinois, which is what we're starting to see. It's frustrating. It's frustrating for you. It's frustrating for us. And for, when people look at Illinois around the country, that's not what that's not the Illinois that they that they that they're used to that they're accustomed to. They used to an, they're used to an Illinois that has a great economy. We've got great people. We've got individuals who are who. If you look at any company that they're located here, and I, I always I was telling the story about SET the other day. If you look at any company that locates, expands, or grows or, or, or grows itself here in Illinois, one of the things they talk about are the people. We talk about the train, the, 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 tra the, the great workforce. We talk about the infrastructure. That's what that's what people are used to for Illinois. They're used to us having the best of the best. Not not some of the stuff we're seeing right now. Uh, so as as we continue to go forward, I need your help. And part of that help is I need you to reach out to the governor because one of the things he always says is he never hears from my community. Why? Well, I, I always tell I always tell folks I'm going to change that. I'm going to give you his number. I need you to call him. Call him. Tell him that you want a resolution to this budget. Tell him that you don't want Washington-style gridlock here in Illinois. His number, got a pen, 312-814. I'm going to wait because I see folks getting pins out. Three one two eight one four two one two one. Again, that's three one two eight one four two one two one. Call him. Let him know. But you don't want you don't want this gridlock. You want a resolution, and the resolution cannot be only support the things that I want, or we can't have a resolution. That's not that's not compromise. That's not government. And part of what I'm very proud about, and the mayor mentioned this in the biographical notes at the beginning, I'm very proud of my, my business background. I'm very proud of that. Uh, it helps me, it helps with my pragmatism, it helps with my level-headedness, but it also means that I understand that the skill set that presents itself in business does not, often, does not always translate into government. At the end of the day, in business, you know, your, uh, your, uh, your, your goal is profit. But in government, your goal is people. And you're there to support and advance and improve the quality of their lives, not the, product, not the quality of your business, which is, again, the, the goal of business. So I understand that. That, make, that means you, it requires that you are compassionate. It requires that you are focused. It requires that you that you, you you involve yourselves in ideas and ideals that will that will move the that will move the government forward. Uh, so uh, let me finish up on on Springfield for a little bit. Uh, I know this is one of the items that the Mayor and I have talked about, and it's extremely important to South Village. We did forward the bill on uh, local government distributed funds, and. For those of you who play the lottery, it's making sure that winners of the lottery uh, will get their funds. Now, I, I will say this. If anybody wins one of those jackpots that are you know, several million dollars or more, uh, I, am your, I will be your lawyer. <laughs> I will only take a small retainer. Uh, it won't be too painful. Uh, but, I, I, but I would certainly I'm certainly open for business. <laughs> I'm just, just, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, but we did, we did pass that bill. Uh, it is, it's, it, it's a waiting, it, it's a waiting action. Um, it was a parliamentary move placed on the bill uh, to transmit it to the Senate. I think part of the issue uh, was that trying to see if the Senate would schedule more days because the Senate had not scheduled days between now and the end of the year. We've got one more se one more session day scheduled, uh, December 3rd. I don't know if the Senate's going to schedule anymore, 
but I hope that they do. Uh, the next important day that everybody should know about is November 18th. November 18th is the, is the, the day that the four legislative leaders and the governor will talk. Now, let me give you a little bit of context. We have had, we're going, we're in our fifth month without a state budget. Fifth. Since November, we are, we usually pass a budget by May 31. Fiscal year starts July 1. It's now, today is November 14th. We don't have a budget, right? The four legislative leaders, the House Speaker, the Senate President, the House Minority Leader, and the Senate Minority Leader, and the Governor, have not spoken, have not spoken since May. Now, the, the looks on some of your faces, think about how we rank and file lawmakers. Uh, so we've had some of those discussions with the Speaker. And I know that the, Senate, the, the Senators have had discussions with the Senate President. In order for us to move it, and that's, that's why this goes back to a discussion about trust. We have mentioned to the Speaker, our caucus, that we want a resolution. We have people who are hurting. We want, we want, we want something done. The Speaker has indicated to us it's very difficult to have a discussion, part of the reason why they have not been talking is because when they do talk, he says they're, all they get are talking points. It's very difficult to have a discussion and get a resolution when you when you're stuck on talking points. Talking points don't get you to don't get you to a resolution. Conversation will get you to a resolution. Understanding that people are hurting will get you to a, to a, to a resolution. So I'm hoping. I was very happy to see that uh, some, of the, uh, some, of the, some of the groups came to the leaders and um, suggested that they meet. The, uh, they said, listen, we, we, want a, we want a resolution. We want you guys to come together. We want you to meet. And they, they said, oh, everybody said, okay, we'll meet. But I don't, I, I hope, and we had a, had a long, uh, intense Democratic caucus this last week when we were in Springfield, uh, it was it was. I've been in the house now, going on three years. It was probably the most intense caucus that I've ever been part of since I've been in the Illinois House. Uh, there was there was quite a bit of there, there was there was a lot of emotions. Uh, folks were frustrated. They're, they want a resolution. And I'm hoping that the 18th will show some movement. But until we see that there are there's a desire to move, I'm not I, I don't I'm not I'm not sure if it will happen. The the governor continues to say he doesn't believe there'll be a resolution until after the first of the year. Well, right now we are sitting on upwards of six billion dollars in unpaid. By the end of the year, there'll be about $8 billion in unpaid bills. Uh, I've mentioned this to you before uh, when I was, I was here, um, maybe it was several weeks ago. The tax increase that, and let me be very clear, the governor keeps saying, if the Democrats want a tax increase, they should just pay for it. I'm not clamoring to raise taxes, but let me be very clear about that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I've not met one of my colleagues who stand on the desk saying, let's raise taxes, let's raise taxes. I've never, I've never seen that person. I've never met that person. What I have seen is a discussion of, we've got to have a balanced approach of dealing with our structural, our structural concerns. That means fixing our spending, but also raising revenue enough to make, to make sure we're not in this situation again. If we, if we reverted our tax rates back to the level they were before, the governor asked us not to, not to make, make that tax, the, the tax change permanent. With the old bills we've got and the unfunded pension liability, we don't we won't even have enough tax revenue then. 
the 5% tax, the tax rate that we, income tax rate that we had before would not be enough money. We are, this, this is a very serious problem. This is a serious problem fiscally. This is, this is a serious problem for our long-term structural health. And because it, because it is, it's, it's such a difficult problem, I don't understand why you're holding up the budget and demanding because, again, we are spending at a level that's higher, you know, the governor always talks about the fact that the budget we passed was out of balance. Well, we've readily acknowledged that, that the, the spending in that budget did not, did not meet the revenues that were, that were in hand, but the governor had several options. And we, we were very clear about that when we passed that budget. Option number one, we could sign it. It was not one, not one that we recommended, but we could sign it. Two, he could line out a veto it to bring the spending levels in line with what the revenues were going to be, which is what, what many of us said do. Three, he could veto it outright, which is what he did, which created a budget impasse. But when you're not talking, you come up with solutions. That's what happens when you don't talk. When you don't talk, you come up with solutions that that may not be in your best interest. And that's, you know, there's no different than our homes. If my wife and I aren't talking, and you know, I'm I'm thinking, you know, best thing for us is to buy a buy a new stove. And she thinks the best thing for us is to buy a new refrigerator. And I go out and buy a new stove. And she goes out goes out and buy a new refrigerator, and we don't have the money for either one of them. We're in trouble. But that's what. But you've got to talk. You've got to talk, and that's that's part part of our problem. Uh, we're, the, the, they're not talking, we, so we're not getting solutions, and so that's 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 where we are. I think that in order for us to get there, hopefully, the rhetoric will stop. But the situation like what happened on Wednesday with me does not help. It doesn't help because that would it was. That there was a strategy to do many of those across the city. That rhetoric like that, attack personal attacks, when <clears throat> some personal attacks like that don't help the situation. It doesn't help. What helps is everybody understanding what the goal is, understanding that in order for us to move forward, we're going to have to work together, we're going to have to talk, we're going to have to be honest with each other, we're going to have to be honest about what the situation looks like. That's what's going to happen. So, Mr. Mayor, I, I'm going to, I know, I, I'd love to try, you know, talk to you. I know I've talked a while, but I'd love to hear from you and hear any questions you might have for me. So. Yes, ma'am. Um, I heard uh, Mayor Hanks mention something about the uh, governor has pulled back on some of the cuts. The $140 million cut originally for the Illinois Community Care Program, is that going to be uh, some of them resolve because that affects a lot of caregivers. I myself have been a caregiver for a number of years and I know of many friends. So that is a consideration. Do you know the status on that? Well, that's, that's one of those areas that we, I was talking about before, uh, the community care program and the home services workers, that he's saying, okay, let me, let me put some emergency rules in place that will that will that will that will you know, stave off those cuts. The problem is, at any time, you could go back and change the emergency rules. Part of the, part of the problem is there there's a part of the legislative process that not a lot of folks know about. It's called the administrative rulemaking process, and that is overseen by what's called the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. So. If the, the governor can, under his executive power and authority, he can institute an emergency rule. And through this emergency rule, he can change eligibility requirements without legislative approval, except through the JCAR, what's called JCAR. The JCAR would then would, would see the rules, and then they would either pass them or, or, or reject them, make, meaning, meaning the policy would be one place or, or, not, or not being implemented. Part of the challenge is, uh, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules has never been a partisan, even though it's made up of partisan members, it's never been a partisan process until very recently. Uh, we have we've, one of our members who sits on 
Jay Carr. He's been in the, he's been in the legislature for 20 years. He's one of our assistant leaders. Uh, he said this was the first time he's ever remembered a partisan roll call in Jay Carr. Jay Carr is usually a it's a policy making arm. It's a policy reviewing arm. But that's what that's what when I talk about Washington level gridlock, that's what started to happen. Even from the bipartisan or traditionally bipartisan areas, they're no longer bipartisan. They're no, they're, they are they are now partisan and it's affecting policy. So changes to the home services program, I don't know. But he, today he said he's gonna he's gonna roll back those cuts. But given past history, tomorrow he may change his mind and say, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the way they were. So I, I can't say that they'll be instituted fully. I don't know. Yes, sir. I can confirm that he has not, he, the, the four leaders, the four leaders and the governor have not sat down since May. Which is contrary to what we hear from the I want The second part is, is there some kind of, uh, uh, you know, they would succinct to take some of the house and take some rules to move this state forward, like, but they don't have to have a certain majority of the vote to pass some these? Could you tell us what that is? That's well, the first, first, first part of the question made me expand on a little bit. Because you, you, you do hear that. You hear in the media, he says, he says I'm negotiating all the time, and I'm doing this, and I'm, we're talking. Let me use Senate Bill 570 as an example. The governor says, uh, well, I reached an agreement and on, on this bill. So I negotiated this bill. So we didn't need to call, we didn't need to call the bill. But who are you to negotiate? The, you didn't negotiate the agreement with anybody who was authorized to make it. You and I can say, okay, we're going to agree on world peace. But if I don't have any, any if I don't have the if I don't have authorization to agree on what world peace is going to be, and you don't have the, agree, the ability to agree on what world peace is going to be, then we don't have an agreement. The agreement's not worth the paper that's written on. So, what, what's frustrating is when you hear, well, we're talking, we're making progress. And I was saying earlier, we'll get in the caucus and we'll say, well, Mr. Speaker, we just heard that you guys are talking. What, what's the update? And he'll, and he'll be very clear. He says, we have not spoken. And if there are, if there are conversations, the conversations hit on talking points. That's not a conversation. If I, just keep re if I just keep repeating a campaign slogan, that's not a conversation. Uh, so... It's very frustrating. The, but the, to your second point, right now, after July 1, after July 1, it takes a supermajority in both the House and the Senate to pass it. So 71 members in the House, 36 members in the Senate. That, the, in order to have anything that would go into effect immediately. On January 1, that reverts back to a simple majority. So on January 1, that's why when I said the government was talking about no, I don't think we'll, well, anything will happen after the first of the year. That's why. Uh, after the first of the year, it refers back to a simple majority, 60 members of the House, 30 members of the Senate. And that's, that's, so that's our time. I think, and I think, honestly, I think that's when we'll see a break in the launch. Unfortunately. The yes, bill that you talked about <coughs> that you got passed to release these, these different funds that's mm -hmm. attached to the, to the lottery. Uh, so, uh, my question you were talking about trying to get the Senate. Me make a decision on this, and this is strictly I'm asking your opinion here. What do you feel? Could you put? What do you feel? The percentage of that happening would be. That, that's tough. I don't know. I, I think I, I I would my my gut tells me wait until after the 18th. Uh, see what happens on the 18th, if anything. The uh, both the House and the Senate. Have been well. The House has been in what's called continuous session, so we've been in session all summer, uh, but also subject to the call of the Speaker. So the Senate, the Senate is in the same. They're in the same situation. They're subject to the call of the Senate President. So if the 18th there is significant movement, I would I would guess you'd see some special session dates called and scheduled uh, that would bring the Senate back to town. 
and, and conversely, might also bring us, would also probably bring us back. If there were, to JW's question earlier, if there was a deal, if there was an agreement, the five leaders get in a room on the 18th and they say, okay, all right, this is going on long enough. Um, you, Mr. Governor, you've got your, your, your fodder for your campaign mailers. Mr. Mr. Speaker, you think you've got your campaign fodder. And Mr. Leader, you've got your fodder. Okay, everybody, let's, let's, let's resolve this thing, let's move on. If you did that, I think you, you could get, you, you get your super majorities in both chambers, you can lead a lot of this thing down. If, honestly, I, I, would, I, would, I would love to have, put this in the hands of rank and file members, but let's come up with some solutions. And uh, I think that's the, way, that's the way you're going to get this thing done. We, and many of us have tried, we've come, back, come up with solutions, we've come up with uh, ideas on how to get to a, a resolution on, on spending reform, but also on revenue, revenue reform. Uh, you know, I, because I, I've often said that I think that the way out of this, this problem lies in reforming our out-of-date tax code. And I think that's, that's the way you're going you're to do it. But I think the 18th is really that day. You know, if there's any significant movement, then you'll, then you'll see some things in the schedule. But if not, if you see more of the same, if you see them get in a room and uh, talk around each other, you won't see any movement until January 1. Hmm? When you were explaining about this Democratic caucus that you fellas had, No, the, the, usually the, the caucuses, each one of the, the legislative caucuses will meet to talk, you know, kind of go through the orders of the day, update, update each other on information, update each other on bills that are out there. So it was, it was it's really, it's more, more of an information meeting for, for the individual caucuses. So it's the House Democrats, the House Republicans, the Senate Democrats, the Senate Republicans. So that group will meet and talk about issues. So again, we'll do it. that's where we get the updates from the speaker on what his conversations were or were not with the governor, what his conversations were or were not with the Senate president, what they were or were not with the House of Lords leader, basically. Others, please. Yeah, I'm Jeff Bowles. I'm from the Democratic Party. Uh, who's picking up the score of the Bears? Who leaves the Bears in the win? Think they're going to win? I think it's 28-17. 28-17. Okay. How many, years, how many yards do you think Gurley's going to get? How many yards do you think Gurley's going to get? <laughs> 250. Oh! <laughs> man! Oh! Hey, right. Oh, man! We're going to put him out of here. Yeah. 250 yards. He's a Bears fan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 whoa, whoa. Uh, I'm with you. Two receptions in one game. <laughs> it's time for you to leave. Yeah. Where, where is the chief when we need him? Where, we need the chief to you know, get some order in here. Because you, you're, you're a lot of order. We're not going to have that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we got to do something about this. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. I, I appreciate you. Again, I, I know. I, I, I'll, I'll talk on and on if you let me, but I just want, again, I want you to know how much I appreciate all of your support, how much I appreciate your friendship uh, when we you know, continue to support our mayor. Uh, and I say that he is our mayor because I, I believe, I feel like I'm part of this community too. Uh, so continue to support him and be, be here to make sure that we're moving South Village forward. I, I just want you to know how much we appreciate all of you Taking, taking time out of your busy schedule and investing in your communities to be here. So thank you so much. All right. Uh, one thing I do want to say real quick is State Representative needs to get his petition signed. If you live between Torrance Avenue and 394, I'm sure that is... Um, 
The gentleman standing in back, if you want to go back there and sign his petition, I'm sure he'd be willing to take your signature. Uh, it's important we get him back on the, the ballot, which is also important for Sauk Village, and he gets real up there. So I appreciate everything he's doing for us in Springfield. You know, I took some bullet points from uh, his speaking, um, from what was said, think about this. Some of the key points I took out of this. The old line does not want Washington gridlock. Um, I also took 312-814-2121. Yeah, get that number down, make sure you get that number. Think about this. The differences between business and government is profit versus people. I don't know if you caught that. And um, here's one thing I, I, I took down. It says, I put down, come to the table now. What does that mean? It means I need you. I'm sure he probably needs you also to contact your House and Senate Majority Leader, your House and Senate Minority Leader, and the Governor, and tell them to come to the table now. That's what's important. So, um, again, you know, we talk about how do you get things moving. Call your state representatives. Okay, we talked earlier. You know, sometimes it's like we only call them about the bad stuff. Call them about the good things too. Okay? We talked a little bit about that earlier. So. Uh, I think the representative Sims are coming out. I know he's got a busy schedule today. He's out running everywhere. And uh, again, him coming out and talking to us is, is an honor. And I really appreciate everything he's doing for us in Springfield. Uh, he's one of these state representatives. I can pick up a phone and he picks up his phone and he answers it. So um, thank you for everything he's doing. So we're going to go ahead and continue going into the meet the mayor portion. Um, and if, if he, if he has to leave early, if you want to go out there and step out there and talk to him real quick, or there's no problem. But uh, one thing I do want to talk about before I take one more question, in fact, I mentioned something about this earlier, was uh, we've got this with the Enterprise Zone. Has anyone heard about the Enterprise Zone? <laughs> Let me give you a little bit of background on, on Sauk Village Enterprise Zone. Back in approximately 1999, Sauk Village signed an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Fort Heights to do an Enterprise Zone. That's over what we call TIF Area Number 3. Okay, So it includes Fort Heights, it includes uh, Sauk Village's TIF area, where you can see one of our major manufacturing areas uh, and um, distribution areas. The state law, uh, state has changed the way it's going to, uh, state and county has changed the way it's going to issue enterprise zones. And as enterprise zones start to dissolve, uh, they're looking at only giving out so many. I think this year they were looking at giving approximately 40 plus enterprise zones throughout the entire state of Illinois. And every year they're going to add a few more. So municipalities were looking at ways to make our enterprise zones more favorable. Think about this right now. Currently, Chicago Heights had an enterprise zone, South Village had an enterprise zone, Fort Heights had an enterprise zone, Stager, I think, had an enterprise zone, South Chicago Heights had an enterprise zone. I could go on and on. Every community has certain areas in that they have enterprise zones. So through South Square Mayor's Managers, the municipalities got together and said, let's form one enterprise zone. The enterprise zone can make up of a total of 15 miles worth of property within the enterprise zone. Sauk Village went together with many communities. We can see we got Beecher, Chicago Heights, South Chicago Heights, State or Sauk Village, Fort Heights, University Park, uh, and Olympia Fields. And also included Cook County and Illinois as property in there also. Back in 2014, all communities, including ADC and Cook County and Illinois, signed an intergovernmental agreement to go into an uh, enterprise zone together. Enterprise zone was, um, went, went and it looked favorable, but there were some issues. There had to be some amendments to the enterprise zone that we presented. Those amendments came back, and I can give you a little bit of an example on, on the enterprise zone, plus we were looking at more than one enterprise zone. One of the amendments that was made was Ford Heights had deal with the original uh, enterprise zone and wanted to uh, make it where Ford Heights continued to be the, the host community and would join all the other communities together in the underneath our underneath one enterprise zone. Well, when we get to the amendment, all the communities agreed, uh, and as of right now, Ford Heights is being a holdout. Okay? Ford Heights. Got to be careful when I say because I know there's many people, especially JW, is trying to negotiate with Fort Heights to get them on board. And there's South Carolina mayor's managers, and there's mayors from other communities that are trying to get Fort Heights to realize this. But in my opinion, Fort Heights, uh, number one, 
thinks they want to renegotiate the agreement that Saga Village and Fortnite has because they want more money. So they're trying to use money as a factor. And they're not only doing it to Saga Village, they're doing it to other communities. And telling other communities that they want Fortnite to sign this paper, they want a certain percentage of all their enterprise loans, and they want to be able to make money off of their improvements and expansions. In my opinion, there's a name for that. Again, I have to be careful since JW is working very hard to try to get this happen. Hang on a second. Hang on, I'll let you talk in a second. <laughs> so, one community is holding up many communities from having what we call an enterprise zone, which brings economic development to the south side. So, you know, I know that people are saying there's things over Facebook. And, you know, last Tuesday we got the board to go ahead and approve the agreement. There's other communities that all approve the agreement. There's only been one community that has not approved it, and that's Fort Heights. Okay. Uh, Mayor of Fort Heights came and says that Stock Village owes them all the money we're looking at. Okay. I can tell you right now there's been no expansions, no improvements in that enterprise zone under this administration. Right. And if there's any agreements in this administration, we'll make sure that we, we abide by them. Okay? Again, we find out where previous administrations might have did some things we're looking into. I've got the attorneys looking into it. I've got our financial people uh, reading it. Uh, we're going through and looking at past ordinances. We're looking for past agreements that were signed. Again, going back to 1999. Okay. So, you know, be careful of everything you read and you hear. Uh, we can tell you that uh, in the end, you know, Sauk Village, if Fort Heights refuses to work with Sauk Village, Sauk Village will continue to work with the other communities, including Chicago Heights, South Chicago Heights, Beecher, University Park, um, Olympia Fields, the Cook County, the state of Illinois, and I'm sure I'm missing someone in there. We will work with Crete, thank you. We will work with those communities to, to make this happen. So um, I know there's a lot of people that are, that are calling uh, Fort Heights, and I know KW. Um, he may have some updates, but I, I, I am a little bit irritated. So maybe it's how I told my voice about how one community can affect the economic development in the whole entire south suburbs that we hold very dear that, that will potentially bring jobs to the south suburbs. So now you can give your update now that you have this the chest. <laughs>
these two trustees are damaging our community. Yeah, I'm trying to be nice. But I tell you what, I, I, I've lived here all my life. And I would never do anything to try to destroy this community. Even, even when I didn't agree with the previous administration, I didn't do anything to try to destroy it. Yeah. I was there to try to help the administration, to try to keep the village going forward because this is where I'm using my family. These individuals, they don't care about you or your families. They don't care. They're, they just want to be able to say two years from now that Salt Village did not move forward and look at Salt Village now. That's why they're, these two individuals are trying to get support to do everything they can to get rid of JW. And they're trying to do everything they can to try to get rid of the police chief. But it's kind of hard to try to get rid of someone who's doing so much work and so much good for our community. We talked about it earlier. If you want stuff done in Springfield, contact your state representatives and contact um, your house, your house and your Senate representatives. We've got a total of five. Three state representatives and two senators. If you want stuff done, you need to contact them. At the same time, just don't contact them when things are bad. You know, because nothing worse for a politician, and I'm standing in front of you as a politician, nothing worse to see a phone call and say, oh, it's from them again. You know? And it's very hard to pick up that phone sometimes, but you still pick that phone up. But you know, it's a lot easier when you hear someone says, oh, you know, oh, thanks for what you're doing, and we appreciate what you're doing. And then every once in a while say, hey, can you, can you do something about this? You know? So we, we all, as politicians, have people out there that are doing nothing but complain, 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 and we know it. But I'll tell you what, it's a lot easier to go off and do something for that one individual who has picked up the phone many times telling us how, how, how happy they are what you're doing, and all of a sudden they have a problem. It's a lot easier to go off that individual. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. Be careful what you read. We talked about it earlier. You know, just like the state representative said, the governor's saying he's, he's working with everyone. He's not working with everyone. You know, be careful what you hear about on the news. Be careful what you read in the papers. I was down in Springfield this last week. I didn't tell you what's happening. You know, to find out that they're not meeting until, until the December 8th or until November 18th. That's crazy. Call your state representative and say, stop, you're pretty locked down. That's all you got to Call the governor's office. No, we don't want you to meet with those state representatives. We're going to meet with the minor, the majority, and we're going to meet with the minor, the House of the Senate. So, I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'm going to do is, we still have about 27 minutes, and the state representative has to take off. If you want to go out there and meet with them, we're going to go out there and get donuts, right? donuts and bagels, but I'm going to open the floor again. And I'm going to see if anyone has anything that they want to any questions. Yes? If this if Four Nights does not go, so then it's done. Is there anything that you could do to like just cut Four Nights out? Very sure. <laughs> <laughs> As soon as I got that email, that email was sent to me. He said, hey, do you know anything about this? You can ask JW. I, I picked up the phone. I called JW. I said, I want to respond to this right away. Number one. Number two, I said, I want every document between South Village and Fort Heights pulled. I want every agreement pulled. I want to know exactly, you know, what legit, uh, anything is legitimate in this email. And, before the end of the night, I had talked to our attorneys, I talked to our financial people, I talked to mayors uh, that, are, that are involved. I didn't get to all the mayors. But before, probably, before next week, I will probably end up talking to every single mayor. There, um, something was going down in Springfield, a group was going down in Springfield yesterday. So you said, so yesterday, they were going down to Springfield to see what could be done about one community, supporting every other community. Stopping this from happening. And there is a meeting tomorrow, which you're, or Monday, which you're attending. Monday, there's a meeting with all the communities that are involved because of uh, what Fort Heights is doing. 
So things are happening, things that already started happening. And which I said earlier is that if Fort Heights wants to be out of the picture, that's fine. Uh, we'll continue to move forward with all the communities that want to be in the picture. And, and, then, and here, here's one thing to think about this. The, the enterprise zone between Sod Village and Fort Heights, number one, will not be renegotiated. Fort Heights will get no money from Sod Village. And it's until 2021. So we're not coming back to the table to try to be, you know, hijacked or yeah, I gotta be careful. <laughs> we're not we're not going we're not going that's not gonna happen. And we're not gonna let it happen because I got two trustees that want to try to make backward deals with another mayor and another community. I can tell you this is the fourth deal and, I, and here I'm gonna go one more step forward. Everyone says that the mayor does not communicate to the board of trustees. Okay, I got a trustee sitting right there. Okay? And I got accused of, well, you only let certain trustees know what's going on. Right? So, let me tell you something. Every time I brought something to the board of trustees, all of a sudden someone tried to stop it. And I know exactly what was happening. You know, we lost a business on the corner of 394 in Sock because of one trustee. And the individual who was bringing it came back and told exactly what that trustee told them. <laughs> and asked him the question, what's up with this trustee? The same trustee took the information that was provided in the executive session and gave it to another community and told that, uh, that developer, you should go to this community over here. Right. They've got all the information. They'll give you a better deal. So I'll go can. That was one deal. We got one pack. We're working very hard, and I did very much not to try to say anything about WinPAC, and all of a sudden word got out about WinPAC. You know, WinPAC right now, uh, there, there's some major hurdles that we're trying to, to jump right now to try to keep them in some building. But because I've got two trustees sitting on the board, they don't care. They're trying to get them to go somewhere else. I can tell you, step after, I can tell you, deal after deal, not deals, but I can tell you where people have come and tried to uh, come to South Village, how started with just one trustee and his little cohort to, that have done everything they can to try to stop things from, from happening in South Village. So, just kind of tell you a little bit, you know, I've been very nice. I haven't said a lot. I don't go on Facebook. If you notice how everything is done to my blog, my blog, I can take everything from my blog, I can go directly over to uh, put it on the mayor's Facebook page. Okay? The only thing I do on Facebook now anymore is in the mornings I go out and wish people happy birthday. It's one of the first things that I try to do. I try to do whoever I'm friends with. I try to wish them a happy birthday. But everything right now is going from my blog or I want to connect with my Facebook page. So, you know, I, or someone may send me something and say, hey, can you post this real quick? I'll get on real quick. And if I do it with my phone or whatever, I'll go to there and I'll share it and stuff like that. So, I, I don't pay attention to Facebook. But I know people come back and say, hey, you know what's being said. Well, no, I don't know what's being said. I can tell you, can tell you the truth. I can tell you, here's what's happening. Because I'm dealing with it every day. So, all right. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, I don't know whether, when you're talking about what you were doing and how you were doing it. Have anybody ever paid attention to how less traffic Standing around is at that gas station near late. So that just shows you what is going on. You don't see those kids up there anymore. You can go there now and you can buy gas or whatever you want to do without being harassed about, can I get this or can you get that? But also, Cook County Sheriff cleaned up that entire area right around where hometown, whatever that used to be called up there. And on Peterson, 216th place in Peterson, all they are there every day cleaning up those houses, tearing them down and going. So a lot of times when people make the statement about what well, this isn't happening, maybe just sometime, just ride around the neighborhood and see the change. You don't see these people standing on the corner anymore. You don't see all that stuff there around that head. Go and look at that kind of stuff that's being done. And then come back and come to the meeting sometime and sit down and tell you how they appreciate what you're doing. This is the way I look at it, like, you know. There's a lot of things. I remember when this new company, AutoZone, came in. The first thing he told us, the first thing he sat there and told us was one of the trustees in that picture with us was bad you. Standing right in the picture next to you was bad you. But this is the kind of stuff that people do, or you don't ever hear about that, but we do because we go and talk to business. I go and talk yeah. to business. 
Just like a deal when I do anything else, I go out, I talk to people, even McDonald's, I don't talk to them when they talk to them about that. There's one person that's always in the front of you talking bad. That person stands into, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. But you can't name me. And he gets mad with me. One thing that he have done to move it forward. The model was move it forward, but name it. He can't. And these are the things that I like for the people. Well, we're sitting here right now. Go around and look at things, how things have changed, how they do things and get things done now. The police department, the fire department, and everything else seems to be working on the same core and getting it done. And thanks to you for doing it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, GW is running a project I have work on right now. I'm trying to make sure it's more transparent. In so you know, he's working on making sure that information gets out to the voters residents, making sure, I don't know if you've noticed, on, on our blog, on our Facebook page, uh, we're putting out the department's reports. So, uh, again, real quick, if you live between Torrance Avenue and, and 394, if you have, have not had a chance to sign the state representatives, I know you probably have to go to next event, uh, you definitely want to make sure that you can sign if you, if you would like. Before I do this, we'll make sure you get a chance for everyone to sign. Thank you, sir. Uh, this, this guy is flying to us at Springfield. So, Thank you. You know, I stand behind him 100%. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Well, we're trying to get more transparency to the residents, make sure things out there. I don't know if you know our blog, I don't know our Facebook page. I'm now putting the department reports, I'm putting that stuff out weekly. And I try to space it out, so like last Tuesday night, I think I've already got like three reports out. I yeah. try to put it out there so you can see what the police department is talking about, fire department, uh, administrative services, as the um, yeah. JW's report, uh, things like that. We're getting that out to the residents. That's one thing we're doing. He's also working on other other things. Uh, and I can't talk about it because right now, if I talk about it, we will try to stop it, right? So, because people don't want transparency. They don't want to see what's happening. They want things to be on site. We're trying to make it where, where things uh, are very transparent and you get the truth. You don't know, come somewhere and leave with questions to it. Right? So, yes. And it's nice to see that things have quieted down on a certain Indiana page because he's not getting as much as he used to because our people are not putting things out there that shouldn't be put out there. So he has nothing to say. Yes. say not too much that's being said, but the two trustee is working with this uh, group on the seniors, the so-called SRO that claim that that's their group, which is the senior committee's group, because they had unfortunately sort of used it for their political headquarters at the last election. And that's what they're working on this time. Unfortunately, it started out with one of our committee members that I brought in years ago. And following the election, he turned on me because they are trying to get all blacks in. Which is now, what we get is rent and raving costs two other black members to resign because they did not want all that confrontation. You know, Sunco is just a very diverse community. We should have a state diverse. That's what's what, what very important. Uh, it's important that we're going to work here just to serve all the residents of Montgomery. We're not here to serve one color. We're not here to serve one religion. We're not here to serve, you know, just one, one type of age people, right? We're here to serve all the residents. So, you know, we're going to continue pushing diversity. We're going to continue pushing uh, our senior center. Uh, there were some changes in the policy, okay? Changes in the policy was put back to the way senior center was supposed to be ran, right? The senior center is ran under the direction of the senior committee, right? What we started to see was all these other committees wanting to uh, form, or these other groups wanting to form their own community, co committees that thought they only answered to themselves and didn't think they had to answer to either the senior committee or even the village. And they wanted to have their own events, they wanted to have all kinds of things where they answered to nobody. So what we've done is under the policies, and I reviewed the policies, and I have a problem with it. Uh, everything now is responsible to the seat of the committee, which is again, where there's a chair, which is the mayor, there's the committee of six members. Okay, everything goes to the committee. That's the way it's supposed to be. There's the committee that runs it. Just like there's a parks and recs, and I always point to parks and recs too. Parks and recs, there's a chair, there's a committee, and if anyone wants to have an event, if anyone wants to do anything through the parks and recs, if they want to even have like a basketball team or a football team, what happens? They 
it must go through the Parks and Recs Committee and they have to do the approval. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, we want to make sure that everything is ran the same through the Senior Center as it is through the Parks and Recs Committee. So, um, you know, again, we're looking at, at these things. It's not about race, it's not about religion. You know, we can go right down the bottom line, okay? It's about our community, okay? It's about our community working together. It's about our community getting out there and again, realizing you can't just form a group and answer to nobody and come in here and use our facilities, right? That, that's what it's about. Yes. Yeah, you need to bring up two the biggest factors that the uh, loud mouths that are doing the most complaining aren't even residents of this village. It's, I find that hilarious. I can say that. You can say that. And it's funny you know, by state statute, you still ask people's names when they come forward at board meeting, but you're, you're no longer supposed to ask for their address. Okay? It's not by state statute. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but you're not supposed to ask for their address. You can ask for their address, you can move them to their address, but you can ask for their address before taking your question to comments. But it's funny how many people I can see coming up and asking questions, and I know they're not even those residents, um, because I've lived here for so long. If you had someone in here new that when you lived in the village for a few years, they wouldn't go on it. So. Just a point of interest, again, you can't say it. Uh, one of those individuals has three separate communities that have restraining orders against them from showing up at their senior centers. Huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyone else? Yes. I, I know that um, with all the memos that the board got, and I got mine about a month later, and everything that was written on that memo pertained to the group, not me. And I was considering defamation of character. All my life I've been a volunteer. I've worked in a, I've lived in a diverse community. I went to school in a diverse community. And I lived in a diverse community and even my church. So all this racism, harassment, intimidation, I've even had this non-resident come up to me and said, um, would you mind if I go to your church? Or where do you go to church? I said, in Dyer. Would you mind if I attend here? He lives in Kenyon City. And if that isn't intimidation, what is it? It's all this. I told him, I don't the church. Oh. <laughs> so, anyone else? We're working on that too. What, you can't get them to church? Because <laughs> <laughs> only God's going to change them. A lot of ministers like you, we're talking about kicking them out of church. Yeah, because I, I, I agree with her. Because, because I, I'm, I, I've gone to the Church of God uh, right down the street since, uh, uh, since April. It, right. it doesn't matter uh, uh, what, pa uh, what Pastor Lyle says. It, it's, not, it's not about race, it, it, uh, none of that. So. As a non visit relative who's African American, I, all I gotta do is drive around this wind and see the uh, <laughs> diversity of housing and look at the grandkids. And you know, I'll say, they use the race and I'll tell them to the faith. But you know, I've told them they're private, private, face to face. All right. Well, we got about this. Yes. Yes. You know, all I do is look at all that information out there. Be, so she, I think she, usually she has it sent in the back table. But what I'll do is I'll get it out on my blog information, uh, and I'll get it on my Matt Garrett's Facebook page. We'll try to get the information out. I'll make sure she puts it in like the next soft talk. Yeah. We'll see if we can get it out. It may already be on the Soft English website because I think that uh, was put out there quite a few months ago. But we'll see if that's still out there. But uh, we'll get that information. We can make sure you get the information too. I just want to let people know, for some reason, a lot of seniors are unaware, South Village seniors, are unaware that we have our open Friday activity. There's no dues, no meetings, except they do, do need to just follow the policy, sign in, come in and play games, and have fun. Yeah. You know, and Rose, I, Rose, this is one of the things that we talked about, and, and a lot of times happens because of volunteers. I'm glad that they're open. Fridays, you know, my goal is, I like to see everything open up every day, but I understand it takes, it takes people, it takes time, because we have to make sure someone's there. Um, but again, 
here we are, this is one step forward. And the open Fridays didn't start until like In January, we will be every Friday. Friday. So 12.30, So here we are, opening the There's those you come to have your seniors in open every Friday. People can come, meet with their friends, you know. I'm sure if I know seniors, there's probably going to be something to eat or something. We have light refreshments. You can't have seniors get down some type of refreshments, right? <laughs> In fact, we have uh, so many games, but the one that seems to be very popular is that one because it's a challenging game. And a lot of new people that have started it, they said they've become addicted to it. They've even gone on uh, Amazon.com and ordered their own for home use. And I said Mr. Williams bought one. <laughs> so he can practice and win. Right? You're saying he needs to practice? <laughs> well, unless you're not throwing quarters against the wall or dice or anything. <laughs> Just the Under the marriage leadership and the last few months through JW, through uh, our, our police chief, I've seen the town. I'm out there every day of the week. I see the town. We get rid of the gangbangers that used to try to run our town where they sell the uh, dope and pot right all on the street. You don't see too much of that. In the middle of the night when we respond to uh, fire calls and you get out there and you got uh, at least uh, 12 to 15 uh, bangers standing around in fire trucks, threatening to uh, burn your fire truck while you're fighting a fire. We don't see that anymore. But there again, it's under a true leadership that wants to uh, aggressively lead this town to the future. We're not standing still no more. Uh, yeah, sure, the mayor and I argued. We always oh, come to some good arguments. But, but there again, it's, uh, I want to move the town forward. He wants to move the town forward. And there's a couple other trustees who want to move the town forward. Unfortunately, it appears, if you just pay attention to the meetings and stuff, it appears that there is a couple of them that don't want to move the town forward that wants to stay still me. People, what the economy is now, if we don't move forward now, we're going to be hurt. Yes. We need to get a band together, and we need to get the right people back in the office. We need to move forward, and we're, getting, we're starting that progress. Just as Mr. Uh, uh, Representative Sam was here tonight. You saw, he was here, he's, he's helping us, and he will continue to help us. And just, just uh, people like that that we have up in the legislation that's going to do that is going to help us move. Sure, we sure we're gonna hold every, every county in the uh, in the state of Illinois and every uh, town in this yeah, in the state of Illinois. We're all hurting. We don't think so. Just grab the uh, get a hold of their uh, website and just go in there and you see how bad. Richmond Park's hurting. Madison hurts. And Briggs hurting. Even as big as Beecher are all booming just before the uh, uh, recession set in, they're, they're hurting. We're all hurting. Yet we have said some state representatives going to sit down and uh, work with us to move this town forward. And that's what it's going to take. So once again, Mary and I probably have some disagreements, but we're all to move this town forward. And we're going to do that. Based on what uh, Justin Mary's he's right. We don't agree with But we have a relationship where we know we can talk. And we're, we're probably passionate about the way I feel about certain things, it's passionate about the way he feels. When it comes down time to vote in here, I find out trustee Myers may not always vote for something that I'm in favor of, but, but he knows it's okay to disagree but not to disagree. He understands, you know, what was I get done voting on this? I'm moving to the next subject. I've had my vote. He's not what people may say is a yes man. But we have a common focus, and that's for the better of the as for improving our community. And sometimes, like I said, we may not agree with certain paths. But in the end, we know we can sit down and talk to each other. And that's what's important. We just heard the um, State Representative Sims talk about there's no communication in Springfield. What happens in Springfield is dead line. Right? Nothing's happening. We can continue moving Stockholm forward because we can communicate. That's what it takes. Okay? Now, not all the time can I get him to change his mind, and not all the time can he get him to change my mind, but there's been times you brought stuff to my attention, and I thought, you know what, you're right, I haven't looked at it that way. Let me go back and do a little bit more research. So, and that's the checks and balances, right? We talk about abortion, and that's checks and balances, right? Three branches of government, 
Springfield has got three branches of government. And you think about it as a municipal level, we always have three branches of government, right? You have your board of trustees, you have your mayor, you have the courts. Right? Springfield, Washington, same thing. Governor, your Congress, and your judiciary. Your judiciary. Okay? Same thing in Washington. So, you know, there's, there's times that we want to go back and forth. You know, sometimes you're going to committee meetings. Committee meetings, I say, is a time when we come down and we get down there on the floor and we sit on the tables and we talk and everyone's passionate and everyone's going back and back and forth. That's what those meetings are for. I've got no problems for that. Okay? Just all the things we can chat again. So we come and we have a meeting where we're sitting on the dais. Okay? All discussion has already been had. Okay? This is where we come up and I want to say a few things on the record. I want to make sure it's on the record. We should come up for a vote. When it gets to there, when we're sitting behind that dais, and there's still questions, and people are still blowing stuff out of proportion, that means they didn't, number one, they did their homework. Number two, they, they're not communicating. And the only communication they're doing is when they're sitting behind that dais and sitting on top of their, their uh, soapbox. So, you know, when, when you get down, when you come in here and you sit behind that dais, you get ready to vote, you should have all your questions answered. I have no problem saying, you know, for the record, I'm not voting for this because of this. But for the record, I'm in favor of this because of this. There's nothing wrong with getting that on the record. But when it comes time to vote, you're asking, on this account's payable, what is this? It says drug test. <laughs> okay? Yes. Well, why didn't you ask the finance director before the meeting? That's why I want to say, but I don't. I very calmly say, for a drug test. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is this amount for? It says to an auto body shop to repair this car. You know, so it needs to be a show sometimes, right? Uh, it's not, this is not a show. This is business. This is getting things done. This is serious. That's why sometimes I make sure that I get a little <coughs> irritated because I take this very seriously. I was a trustee for 14 years before becoming your mayor. For 14 years, I did my homework. I got my packets. I went through them. My wife can tell you how many nights I stayed up going through there with a highlighter. Coming in here on Monday or Tuesday, getting with finance director, having a question, or going to talk to the chief, or going to talk to the public restaurant. What's it, what, why can we do this? Why can we do that? So that when it came time to vote, I knew the answers. That's what you're supposed to do as a trustee. Mayor, let me, let me say one thing. I, I, I have asked the mayor to look at me. I grew up in Mississippi. This stuff about race is passe. I was just, uh, you know, you're going to have people talk about that. And trust me, he knows that he's had to sell. I've said to those groups that come in here, and I'll say it again to you, and I'll say it to Jesus Christ. If they start saying we want exclusivity, that's Mr. Mayor. I do not agree with exclusivity to describe that they want to have it so solely for themselves. It is not going to happen. Period. So you don't have to be apologetic about all this. If we get to what we're going to have coming, coming up in terms of all this other stuff, listen to what's going on really. This is about trying to divide this community racially to get elected up here. And I rule today of guess what? I don't live here and I'm here to try to help you. But, you know, if they get elected, I'm telling you, I feel very sorry. And I'm not a politician. I'm just telling you. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you get elected, not because I need a job. I think I know what would happen to other people to get there, and I know what he's done. And I told them to face to face, privately. I don't say this, he knows that. If you, I said, Mr. Trustee, if you're tired of this, this, this blog out here, my dad said, you are who you hired. You cut June, you're who you, who you hang with. So you hang with this blog, so you're a racist. I told him that face to face, and I'll tell him this again. Just tell him. All right, one more question. You got one minute left. Okay. Uh, I was uh, listening to Trustee Meyer saying that you have people standing up talking about what they were going to do with the five trucks and things like that. I was afraid. Uh, I, was a, I just asked a question. From now on, why don't you get one of these five extenders and keep it with some ink in it? <laughs> <laughs> man, that's a good idea. So when they start spraying, hey, spraying, and I don't know who they is. We know who they is from that time. Frank, Frank, we'll turn them. We don't want that. <laughs> I say a more quick. I got thirty seconds. Let me just right here first. Just a question. Have they gotten the emails from the trustees? Because 
again, because it seems like there's always one trustee that never gets his email because it's a problem with the email. Trust, trustee's emails have been fixed. We don't check. Okay. We've double checked. I've had Daryl talk to him several times and come out and show it to him. That's all I can say. And we've double checked. Just show me how to do it. We've double checked. Yeah. Well, we've double checked to make sure if the trustee did not receive it, we found out they did. And we can check that Gerald can give us that end time, but he just walked yeah. in front of all. Because they are, they are village accounts, so we were able to go into the village accounts to make sure they receive them. One, one, one more real quick, Jake Tucker. Yeah, just, just as far as the comment made about Rose being discriminatory, I can attest that she isn't because she's in the history books for slave, serving coffee to both sides of the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. Y'all yeah, take care and have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you.